Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of the D2 Talks. My name is Fabio Palvelli and on this channel every week we bring you talks with some of the best offices from the archivist industry. So if you're new here, please do consider subscribing. Today we have a very special guest, the guys from Uniform from the UK. Uniform is sort of like a multidisciplinary company and the work that they do is very interesting. It ranges from graphic design to archivist, marketing, I personally consider them some of the pioneers when it comes to this concept. Anyway, as always, enough of me, blah, blah, blah. Enjoy this beautiful talk with the guys from Uniform. I'm so happy to have you on the show. You are Uniform for who don't know you. We have Tony, Nick, Mark. Guys, I'm very excited to have you on the show because of uh, what you have been able to establish within the, the archivist scene. And there are a lot of questions that I want to ask you uh, related to the type of work that you do and how you moved into that direction. But yeah. I would like to start from the very beginning so, as of how did you start? Okay, so so I think, you know, the, the journey for Uniform started uh, back in 1998. Uh, so I was at university here in Liverpool uh, studying product design and I became good friends with the two other co-founders, uh, Nick and Pete. Um, and, and I think it was, it was over the summer in the second year that some friends of ours were actually um, doing some graphic design and branding for a, a hair salon. And they then asked us, they, you know, they said to us, right, you, you, you know, you guys do product design, do you do interior design? And, you know, can you help us design this interior of this hair salon? So naively we said, yeah, sure, we can do that. Um, so we, we started our kind of first job with the three of us designing this hair salon. Um, and it was, you know, doing the interior design. And <laughs> part of that was, you know, doing some visuals to show what this interior design would look like. Uh, I think that then led on to us uh, doing another project with them, which was um, like a restaurant space also in Liverpool. Um, and so, you know, from those early beginnings of uh, doing the interior design, the, the main goal was actually for us to become product designers. So we were, you know, we were all at uni studying product design and we wanted to be doing, you know, designs for furniture and lighting and things like that. Uh, but we didn't have any money. So, you know, doing these kind of first interior design jobs were quite a good way of giving us some cash to be able to do our own work. Um, and so, you know, I, I think after a while we've done a few of these, you know, uh, hair salon, we've done a restaurant, we then started doing various kind of bars and nightclubs for various dodgy Liverpool gangsters. Um, and you know, that was kind of going okay. And at the same time, we were actually also uh, developing our own products. Um, but for, for each of these interior designs that we do, we would, you know, like I say, produce visuals for it, create CGIs. And I think it kind of came to a point where we thought that actually maybe working for the architects and the developers was uh, a, kind of a safer way of getting paid than working for the, the, the dodgy Liverpool gangsters who maybe weren't so keen to pay us all the time. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, then I guess we, we kind of got quite hooked on the whole 3D side of things. I mean, as you know, it's quite an addictive thing, isn't it? You know, you start doing 3D and then you really get excited by it. And, you know, for me, it was always a bit like kind of playing with Lego. Um, it's like a virtual Lego, isn't it? Which I, you know, obviously used to always love as a kid. Um, so, you know, that, that was kind of where, where things started. I think it, that's also the reason why, for instance, my wife thinks that I'm playing video games when I'm making 3D, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, there's, yeah, there's some similarities, aren't there? Yeah, yeah I, I think we share, in a way, the same kind of reality. But it's, uh, it's cool to to see how from not knowing the stuff, how you kind of like, you know, went along and developed a business out of it. I think this is very impressive in a way, you know. Uh, you know, now talking about the business side of the thing, how long did it take for you f to go from, okay, we're doing this kind of <laughs> stuff, you know, we are sort in a liquid state, yeah. To the point where you say, okay, now we're a company and, you know, we're very yeah. good at this. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think probably it took about 
So we, we started in 1998, uh, so like I say, 20 years ago this year, and I think it probably took till about maybe 2005 where we really started to feel like we were working for some, you know, quite big development projects with some quite well-known architects. So at that point, we were doing a project in London with a company called Foreign Office Architects, and it was this kind of um, uh, quite faceted, crystalline kind of sculptural building. And that, that was a project which kind of felt like quite a turning point, really, um, because at that, at that stage within architectural visualizations, um, films, well, f films were very much fly-throughs, and they were often quite a kind of robotic camera which would just move through a space. It was like a, you know, a walkthrough. And I think that we felt that what we wanted to do was A, inject some narrative into that, and B, to bring some, some of the effects which we were seeing in film and TV, uh, which we would then try and you know, replicate. So whether it was uh, getting aerial footage and then camera tracking that or you know other kind of visual effects that we wanted to try and really bring some of those effects into architectural visualization and some of those early films yeah. were a good way of doing that yeah we, we always used to joke about hollywood effects and they were all prices <laughs> <laughs> it's that kind of yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah so, so i think that was that was at the point where it felt like uh, you know, some of the films that we were doing were starting to get a bit of recognition within the industry. Um, and it felt like we were, you know, trying to kind of really push the boundaries with some of those, those films. Yesterday, it's funny that you're saying this because yesterday I was uh, listening to a lecture from, I don't remember a guy that uh, worked on the movie of Iron Man. And, okay. And he said, you know, to make a minute of, say, an animation of, uh, you know, the interface of Iron Man, it will cost this, uh, about $250,000. Um, and yeah. he said, you know, and then we heard that uh, there are some buildings in New York that actually, you know, visualization studios do the same kind of work for the same kind of money. That must be great, you know, it's so easy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Trust me, it's not as easy as people would like to think. <laughs> But, you know, now that you mentioned this, uh, I know that this is not one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, but did you find some sort of uh, friction into trying to bring some narrative into the uh, wanting to tell a, 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 the story yeah. of a building in a different way than a fly through? Um, I think I think not, not too much friction because, you know, I guess it's all about selling the idea to the client and persuading the client that actually the concept of you know the crystal flying through the sky or the you know the, the narrative of the building which you know, you're, you're seeing it uh, building itself if, if if you can explain the thinking behind that concept um and they can really understand that and take that on board then you know it, it, it's it's an obvious choice for them but actually the the end result and the, the message which that communicates is far more powerful than you know, the generic fly-through yeah, where you're yeah. walking through the building and you're not kind of telling any of that story. So, you know, I, I think actually we, we, we had clients who were probably quite um, understanding and they, they maybe also wanted to kind of push the boundaries a bit too. Yeah, I think it all depends on the client. Like, I don't yeah. think that's really changed throughout the years. You know, we're still, we're still doing that now, depending on the client for the project. Some people You'll, you'll come up with a big concept and you'll have the big story and they'll you know, say, well, can't we just go in and fly around a little bit? And it's, it's just purely based on the client. Yeah, you, always, you, you do always get like, kind of friction. They go like, you know, if you don't try, you're never going to get through it. So, you know, try trying every, every time, you know, with a, with a different concept and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, it's trying and yeah. that counts, really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> This is beautiful, you know, I, uh, one of the things that I hear all the time is that um, clients, you know, they get hooked too much on the, you know, details that maybe people might not understand, uh, yeah. when actually what you have to sell, it's an emotion. 
Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because, you know, it, it, it is absolutely often the case that the yeah. client is very focused on the functional yeah. details rather than... But people don't remember the functional details. What people remember is the feeling of having watched the film or seen the images, and it's not really the details. They can find the details in, you know, the drawings or the, yeah. you know, the specifications. Yeah, um, they've seen themselves sat in, <laughs> in that penthouse, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. it? yeah. Guys, um, one of the things that struck me about your work is you seem to have been predicted, in a way, the trends of like what architecture visualization would have been before a lot of other people kind of figured it out, you know? So you're kind of providing a more holistic, uh, complete package to your clients. And, you know, for the big, for the smaller guys, very often the, the issue is how do we manage to produce images and stay in a budget when actually yeah. you seem to be able to produce not only the images but like a more complete uh, concept and, um, uh, you know, product. Yeah. So, oh. you know, I'm interested to hear when did you start to make the shift and how did that happen? How did you, yeah. you know, manage to pull it, uh, pull it off? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, going back to that earlier question of when did it start to feel like we were uh, kind of getting somewhere, that, that point of around 2005, 2006, where we were starting to do the more of the broader film work, that was obviously a kind of pivotal moment. But then actually, I guess, uh, you know, I guess around 2008, 2009, with the kind of global financial crisis was also a key kind of uh, part which really kind of forced our decision making as a business because um, you know it was at that point that the work within kind of property and architecture and architectural visualization felt like it was kind of going off a yeah. cliff um, <clears throat> and it was at that point that we uh, decided to focus more on kind of broadening what we do, not just within property and architecture, so to take away a little bit of the risk from only being focused in property and architecture. Um, and I think, so it was at that point that we started to work with other clients in, you know, sport or consumer goods or the arts. And, and I think that, um, the, the, the things that we learned from doing that have then probably helped uh, inform everything that we do, even within architectural visualization. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think that uh, that was kind of quite a key, a key point in time. Yeah, and it, was, it was kind of at that point where we, we invested more in R&D yeah. and, you know, future tech, That's, and, yeah. you know, and started to kind of innovate that way, and we started you know, we, we've got a big maker space now where we've got loads of, you know, tools where we start to build things. Yeah. And I think by kind of starting to think about a shift that way really helped us at that point. Yeah. It's also, it's also like an ongoing process. It's not like there was a certain period of time where yes. everything happened and now we're kind of on top of it. It's like, it's still like everyday thing where you kind of try to learn and develop stuff and do it differently. So it's, you know, it's like this yeah. constant kind of little struggle we do. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but yeah, I think that the you know uh, the the focus on R and D. I think at, at, at that point where um, things were looking bad from a, a global financial point of view, it it did really make us sit up and kind of think, right, okay, well, we need to be constantly trying to you know, innovate and yeah, do, yeah, do the R&D to be able to try new techniques and so on, so that actually we are still kind of staying, um, you know, ahead of the, the game as much as possible. Yeah. Now, it's funny that you're mentioning, uh, mentioning R&D. We're going to go back to that in a second. But there is something that I want to ask you, which is very <laughs> relevant, uh, as in, you know, making the shift and start to offer more. I mean, the more you do, the more um, liabilities you have within the studio. And part of dealing with this is also dealing with fear. Yeah. Uh, how do you overcome that? I mean, I would be very scared to go into a brand new field yeah. without, you know, knowing f uh, for sure in which direction I have to move. How did that happen for you guys? 
I mean, how uh, do you overcome the fear? How do you uh, yeah. make the right decision to move into that direction? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a really interesting question because I actually don't think you ever do overcome fear personally. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, you know, I think, it's, I think it's having that, you know, I think you, you need to have some level of fear to push you forwards to actually try and make things a success. Because if, if there is no level of fear, then you've got nothing to lose and, yeah. you know, you're not as driven. Um, so, you know, I think that... I think that, you know, the answer is that I, I don't think you ever lose the, the sense of fear particularly. No, um, no, I think it's good to have it. I, I think it is good to have it. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, obviously whenever we do uh, try something new in terms of what we offer as a business, um, that will be on the basis that some parts of the business are working well already and that gives us the ability to be able to invest more time and money in trying a new thing. You know, obviously, if uh, you're trying something totally new and you don't have anything which is stable, that's probably a bit risky. Yeah. But, um, you know, you, you need some elements of stability to be able to try those new things. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful answer. And also, I think that, you know, in a way, the fact that you guys are so successful, it's also the, so to say, reward for taking those kind of risks. So kudos to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, well, you know, going back to the discussion of R&D, research and development, yeah. you guys seem to be very, uh, very active about doing research and development. And I'm going to push myself a little bit more uh, forward by saying that I know personally people that work for you guys and they are very active in doing research and development whilst keeping the focus of like knowing that they're part of a team, which yeah. I think is a beautiful thing. So, you know, I get two questions out of this observation. The first one is how do you implement the research and development within the office? Like, you know, how do you schedule it? How do you make it happen? Yeah. And second of all, how do you manage to keep such a beautiful, um, I want to say like uh, harmonic uh, corporate identity where, you know, people are very proud and very happy to work with you guys? Yeah. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I think that, you know, the, the research and development side of what we do it has been really important and there's, there's various different kind of strands of research and development that we do uh, because you know within the architectural visualization team there's uh, research and development so uh, these guys are kind of leaving a uh, you know a whole kind of course of research and development that we you know will last through the year so we'll have a program of kind of events which will happen where you know the team will all get involved in learning new skills. Um, but then there's, I guess, the broader research and development, like um, we have a team who are creative technologists, and yeah. those guys are all about, um, I guess, thinking about how we can use technology to help communicate with our audiences in really exciting ways. So, you know, whether it's um, one of our you know, self-initiated projects that we do, like we've recently uh, created something called an emotional radio. Um, and I mean, yeah, you can have a look at it on the website, but it's it's something which is, it's exploring how uh, AI, artificial intelligence works, and it's exploring how we interact with AI. So basically it's a, um, it's a product which hangs on the wall and you walk up to it and it will look at your face and decide whether you're looking happy or sad. Uh, it then is connected to the Spotify API and it, each song on Spotify has a kind of happiness rating. Um, it will then play you back a song which it thinks is appropriate to your mood right now. Um, so, you know, this kind of R&D like that, which This happens, is which awesome! Is <laughs> um, but, um, you know, those kind of self-initiated projects that we've done over the years, they, they, they're very much uh, a kind of a way for us to explore technology, for us to form an opinion about that technology, and 
you know, the, the great thing about them is they get released in the press and then clients phone up and say, oh, we saw that amazing, you know, emotional radio yeah. that you did. Can we, you know, can we buy a hundred of them and then... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you do that. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, there's kind of R&D which happens in various different places, but, you know, it's, it's definitely something which I think we've found is really important. I mean, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I think kind of going back to the kind of team R&D, that's, you know, scheduling it and all that, it's always been difficult and kind of, you know, depending so much on the kind of work work kind of load and how much work we got. So we, you know, we're trying to get better at kind of really kind of making like a, a bit like long longer term planning of around it and kind of start time to schedule it. So you know we got like kind of uh, stuff where we um, go through kind of you know basics of art uh, or we kind of research kind of so kind of going broader, kind of going kind of away from the archives, kind of learning to you know photograph or drawing and things like that. Um, but then, yeah, I also like kind of, you know, little techniques and programs you use and, and how it's kind of best utilize our time, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, we've, we've got a lot better at it recently. We've got more of a structured kind of calendar now yeah. where it's like over the year and everybody can see, you know, over the next three months we're going to be learning drawing, yeah. Yeah. we're going to be doing a creative challenge, you know, every two weeks where the whole team steps away from the computer and we try and solve something yeah. um so yeah there's, there's lots there's lots of stuff yeah. that's in there and yeah. i think it's being visible to the whole <laughs> team you know at least they know yeah. what's what's coming up over the next year no yeah if you schedule it kind of over a year then you have like quite a big chance you know to hit at least a good amount of it even if you do half of it it's pretty amazing so it's kind of like but if you don't do that step really what happens is it always gets pushed by kind of work yeah so trying to kind of be a bit more strict about that i mean it has yeah but it has been a real challenge to try and make sure that yeah. that sort of thing happens yeah. because it's so easy to uh for, for that time to just get overwritten with uh you know fee paying work yeah uh, but then you know ultimately then if we do that all the time, then we're not really developing as a team. Yeah. And I, th I think that, you know, I guess the other thing we try and do is any, you know, any of those learnings that we learn from the R&D sessions, we will then really make a big effort to try and implement, even if it's little bits of them in projects on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, it feels like we're really putting it into practice. Yeah. <laughs> And connecting to the project really helps because then you can kind of even do it rather than just kind of research into it and then kind of slowly forget about it. Yeah. yeah. And I think we've got we've got like a, a list of R and D kind of a wish list and as soon as there's anything any kind of downtime or if the project gets moved by a few days, you know, we've got that list to go back to and we can easily yeah. fill that time with something really productive. This is all very interesting, you know, this is uh, honestly the very first time that I hear a company talk about this aspect in this way. I'm just curious, is anybody like coaching you or advising you on this? Do you use external inputs or is this coming from you guys? Um, pretty, pretty this, internal, yeah. yeah, this is all coming from us. I mean, I guess one thing which we do, which is kind of external training, is that um, you know, once once a month or once every couple of months, uh, the whole company uh, will have a will, will be a, 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 an external speaker who will come in and talk to us about you know what they do. So you know, we, we talked about AI earlier in the emotional radio. So a guy who was like head of robotics at the university uh, university in in England came and spoke to us, uh, or a um, the head of 3D at uh, the mill, uh, who actually used to work here at Uniform. Uh, he came and spoke to us uh, two weeks ago and talked about their projects and their process. So, yeah. you know, I think that, I think that, you know, in terms of kind of coaching, we get inspiration from those people who, you know, give us ideas to then work out, well, actually, how, how then are we going to go and try and implement some of those ideas? So, reading mm -hmm. loads of books. <laughs> this is very impressive, I have to say, you know, it's uh, because I research all the time ways to, you know, think of how I can help my clients to get a better relationship with their uh, clients or with the people working for them. And this is giving me personally a lot of inspiration. So 
I really hope that the people that are listening to this, they're going to be able to take something out of it. I, I think it's a, it was a beautiful way that you put it out. So I'm very happy for you doing this. Cool. Now, uh, no, no problem. Uh, I know that you guys have a Napolitan guy working for you. Is that true? <laughs> We do. Uh, <laughs> Antonio. You, you gotta be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. We're aware of this. <laughs> <laughs> I I look forward to seeing him uh, to seeing him later. Uh, I have one more question for you guys, yeah. which is if somebody is thinking to get into this line of work and you know they look up to you and I know that they do mm-hmm. and they would like to know what's your secret or what's the thing that you could recommend them to do in order to have a healthy career what would yeah. you tell them um, I mean I, you know it's it's uh, it's the holy grail question that isn't it but the, the, the I don't think there's any one single answer I mean I think you know for I think what we find is that it's really important for people to obviously lots of learnings from you know people like you Fabio from the, like the data events that you guys put on so you know going to all of them taking inspiration from you know other studios is obviously really important putting into practice um, you know artistic techniques is absolutely you know the critical part of it because uh, you know it's much easier for us to teach people technical side of things in terms of you know which, which buttons to press rather than that having that artistic vision so I think you know for people to be able to focus on um, having an artistic vision for uh, a piece of work a project would definitely be a, a really key piece of advice um, yeah yeah <laughs> definitely I think it's kind of yeah kind of lear- a lot of learning like constant learning I think that's like a big thing uh, but I also think kind of like it's kind of you know being mindful of why you have you know, you as an artist quite like because it's kind of, it's quite easy to kind of, you know, lose yourself into all the kind of pleasing the client, and then, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of that insight into what, what you kind of, as an artist like and what kind of clients you kind of want to get rather than kind of, you know, fighting the windows or whatever kind of, um, so I think that's quite important kind of being good, kind of looking inside and kind of trying to find how you kind of, you know, manage your your being happy and the client being happy kind of finding that right balance i think is really i mean important yeah just just one more thing on that because i'm sure that you've got something to say I mean, <laughs> one, other th- one other thing would be uh, i guess about personal communication as well because you know in, i think in this job obviously being able to produce amazing art is the, the, yeah, a, ma- a massive kind of goal that people need to try and achieve, but, but also to be able to communicate ideas, whether it's visually or verbally as well. And it go, goes back to that point of being able to persuade the client that actually the idea that we've got for this project is a really good idea and it's going to ultimately help them and communicate to their audiences in a really kind of exciting way. So I think that ability for people to be able to communicate is important. Yeah, definitely. definitely. I mean, for, for me, I think it's it's just open your open your eyes to be inspired by everything you know don't don't just look at, at cg you know archives work and think that's you know that's amazing i want to do that you know go to art galleries pick up a camera you know learn how to draw you know look at the masters old artwork you know like go to the park and look yeah. at how the trees move you know that just be inspired by everything and not just looking at CG kind of obvious stuff. Yeah, yeah kind of wider references. Yeah. Good, yeah. <laughs> this is so beautiful, you know? I think, <laughs> no, seriously, I, I really do think so because, I don't know, I think that in the, in the very beginning of my career, I had no idea what I was doing. I was throwing a lot of things to the wall to try to see what was sticking. Yeah, yeah. And I wasn't throwing hard enough, things were not sticking. And then you start to connect all the dots and then you you see that you guys are saying basically the same things over and over. And this just consolidate the idea that, you know, we need a community and we need people to talk about this stuff. So for that, I'm super thankful. Only one thing that gets me very confused is what's happening behind you. (laughs) 
I'm not doing we got some politicians uh, coming in. Yeah, no, so, so I think you, we got you Brazilians. Got we got what's going on? Are there more people coming? Yeah, yeah, more of us, yeah. Are there more yeah, people coming? Sh should we wait for everybody else? Yeah. Nah, okay. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I think. Hopefully, they, they'll all okay. be making an appearance, and you can. Uh, okay, so up. let's let's do one thing since we are already hitting our thirty minutes mark. Let's call yeah. the whole office and let's squeeze it inside this room, shall we? <laughs> bring them all in. <laughs> Let's bring them all in so that we can all say goodbye and. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 get Deja. Man. I don't know whether we'll be able to get the whole team, but uh, we'll get <laughs> Deja. There is lunch. Now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, just the, the, just, just what, no, one more thing I was going to say. I mean, you know, you kind of uh, mentioned it then, Fabi, about you know, you uh, in your experience, you, you try. You know, throwing things at the wall and seeing what's stuck. And I think that goes back to that question about um, failure, doesn't yeah. it? Because I think you absolutely yeah. need to keep trying new things. And you know, lots of them will fail. And you know, lots, lots of things that we do fail all the time. Um, but it is just a case of you know, persevering and continuing yeah. with that, isn't it? I think, I think that's a part of everything. You know, you've, you're looking at the camera composition. You do 30 compositions that, you know, essentially you'll fail because yeah. you end up on number 31. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's you know, f funny thing is that uh, people uh, sometimes look at me and uh, the most hateful comments that I get is, yeah, what do you want? You're rich. You have it all figured out. And I'm like, <laughs> are <"What?"> you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. And yesterday I was talking to a guy that I wanted to hire for uh, an idea that we have. And the guy asked me $10,000, no, uh, you know, no other parameters like, oh, yeah. maybe or no, 10,000. Otherwise, I'm not interested. And I was like, ah, shit, I had this idea in my head and now I cannot make it happen because I don't have that money. And I was like, you see, I failed. But I now know that... You know, you I have to get, <laughs> yeah, I need to get to that goal in order to make that other thing happen. So yeah. I think, you know, people are just afraid to be shut down and to yeah. be asked for $10,000 and not to have the $10,000. But if you don't try, you'll never know, you know, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. No, Guys, absolutely. Ca ca can we get the whole office to say hi? <laughs> <laughs> So happy to see you, Johnny boy. What's happening? I'm saying hi. <laughs> Tonino. <laughs> Tutto bene. That was Italian. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a little bit blurry behind. Who do we have? So we've got we've got Isaac. We've got James. Ja we've got oh, Adam, James. We've James. Got Alex, I think Adam. John I've already Ronald. met. Adam yeah, and James are met already. To be honest, there's quite a few missing, actually. But, uh, <laughs> they must have thought that it was more important to go and have their sandwich than... Uh, <laughs> really oh, man. Cool. That I can totally relate. You know, I'm <laughs> Napolitan. 70% of my budget's made of pizza. You give me a pizza, <laughs> I change priorities. Guys, thanks a lot for taking the time for doing this. I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah, uh, right, oh, well, thank you. one thing that I haven't done... Hold on. Let me just... I'm going to overlap uh, your Facebook page to this recording so that people can kind of see where you guys are and they can come and, uh, you know, see yeah. your work and uh, and maybe, you know, if they want to get in touch, I'm pretty sure that you are willing yeah. to, to answer a couple no, of, of emails. Yeah. I mean, uh, we did just launch a new website, so it might, might be yeah. worth checking out. Yeah. Yeah. Check out that on the Instagram. Uh, yeah. New, yeah, off his Instagram as well. Oh yeah, that's right. You started a brand new Instagram. I remember yeah. seeing that. Uh, yeah. We we follow each other. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I'm gonna stop the recording and then right. I'm gonna say goodbye to you yeah. in a more private uh, right. manner. Okay. Thanks a lot for doing this. Yeah. I really All appreciate right. it. Thanks, Fabio.